There is a wasted resource most likely hidden in plain sight in your garden. You need to start eating your lawn, or what grows in it. I'll explain. There is a real banquet to be had here. You just have to know where to look. These dandelion greens, they're found everywhere. They're amazing because they're nutritious and I think they're delicious. They may be bitter, maybe too bitter to some people, but I know just the way of preparing them that to me it just complements the flavor in a way that's, I don't know, I haven't had anything similar. <laughs> Dandelion is a highly nutritious vegetable that has been branded as a weed due to its successful breeding and tenacious determination to live. Rich in vitamins A, E, and K, as well as calcium, potassium, iron, and other phytochemicals, it is a diuretic and an anti-inflammatory plant and shows even anti-cancer properties. No wonder it was part of the physician's medicinal herb garden since ancient time. It is easily recognizable by its yellow flower that turns puffy and white. All the leaves and flowers originate from a basal rosette without a stem. The leaf is usually deeply serrated as long teeth. That is where it got its name, Dent de Lion or Lion's Teeth. I reserve my cache of dandelion leaves inside to prepare a delicious recipe that highlights and complements its bitter flavor. I fill the bowl with water and let it stand until I needed to use it. Meanwhile, I had to cut the lawn, which frankly is my least favorite gardening chore. The fact that I call it a chore is telling, much like it is telling that others call dandelion a weed, but mowing the lawn is a rather unsustainable practice that I've always failed to see the use of. When we got into this place, I had romanticized delusions that I would actually be able to cut the grass with this manual lawn mower. The idea was nice, not using fossil fuels, using manpower to drive a simple machine or not so simple machine, using a Victorian inspired design in a Victorian house. It all seemed to square, but the thing is, I'm sure that if Victorians had lawn mowers, power lawn mowers, they would have they would have used it in a heartbeat. I found one problem with this design. The problem is, I think there's an issue with design where grass just gets bunched up right here. And I don't know if it's this machine specifically, where if all of these types of machines have this issue. But another problem is that this limits, the, the height of this bar limits the height of the grass that you can cut. So you can cut lawn that's already cut, basically. But if you let your lawn grow, you won't be able to cut it. So, unfortunately, I had to migrate to the dreaded, noisy lawnmower. And cutting the lawn is the least sustainable activity we can do when gardening, especially when using gas-powered equipment. I suppose a lot of men especially love to use lawn equipment because it instills in them a sense of power. Indeed, fossil fuels have tremendous potential power and that is why we have not transitioned to other sources of energy by and large yet. Using manual machines like this real mower is a real challenge. While it is good exercise, it frequently jams when a stick gets stuck in its reels. I can only hope someone would develop a hand-powered mower that can cut taller grass and won't get jammed with sticks. This can really test the patience of even the most well-tempered gardener. No wonder lawns only became the ubiquitous carpet of suburbia when gas-powered mowers were invented. It is disheartening to look into the prospect of cutting even a quarter acre of lawn with this machine. I had enough. I was even seriously considering a scythe, despite knowing that that takes more work, skillful practice, and incessant sharpening. Sometimes the best laid plans and greatest intentions have a way of falling apart. But in all seriousness, we need to find better technological solutions. So unfortunately, I have to use one of these. They're loud, they smell, they give me asthma attacks, 
But at least they're reliable. Well, unless that happens. Let's try it again. Come on. The scythe was looking more and more appealing with each pull of the string. I just had no clue where to buy one. I suppose I would have to find a dry goods store that also stocks anvils and plows and other anti tools. And this is exactly why I hate the lawn. And frankly, since I don't have flocks of sheep to feed, my lawn is useless. At least the grass. I'm valuing more the so-called weeds, like dandelion, that actually provide me with food. In fact, the industry's conspiracy to eradicate them from lawns with potentially carcinogenic chemicals seem like a perfect way of scamming people out of their money, creating a false sense of dependency. The indie lions are not a weed. Your lawn is adequate. You are adequate. Industry advertisement drives into our heads the idea that we are inadequate if a single dot of yellow sprouts in our lawn. I'm here to show you that that is not the case. So why do I even keep a lawn? Grass clippings. They are a great way of boosting nitrogen and other nutrients plants need while providing me with much lauded mulch. Its gentle flex work wonderfully well around tender leaves. I add a dusting of grass clippings on my plants every time I cut the grass and I've had good results not even adding organic fertilizers as I used to in the past. So I'm starting to see my lawn as a producer, not just an idle consumer of my time, energy and soul. Coming up in the next block, I will show you a scrumptious recipe for thin crust dandelion tart you will be surprised by right after this commercial. Suburban Homestead is brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you. You can support this channel through Patreon or by buying art through my Etsy shop. To make this recipe, you will need one cup of flour, one tablespoon of yeast, half a cup of water, two tablespoons of olive oil, a pinch of salt, and a bowl. Mix all the dry ingredients together with a spoon. I'm using gluten-free flour here, so the process and ratios will change a bit if you use regular wheat flour. The main difference is that wheat needs to develop the gluten and may take more water to get to the right consistency. Add the oil, mix, and then trickle in the water, mixing as you go, until the right consistency is achieved. If you decide to do this with regular flour, I would advise to start by mixing all the other ingredients except for the wheat flour, adding it gradually until it is elastic, pliable, and easy to handle without sticking. Once the dough has formed a uniform ball, it is time to knead it a few times. Gluten-free flour doesn't need to be kneaded actually, but for regular flour, kneading well is essential. I covered it and let it rest for one to one and a half hours. It will not rise much because it is gluten-free but it will develop the flavor. It will be soft to the touch. I cut out a piece to roll it into thin crust using a rolling pin. While gluten-free flour is considerably less sticky than wheat flour, to prevent it from sticking, I dust the surfaces with flour and add more flour as I go along. I try to roll it from the center out, changing directions and flipping the dough constantly to achieve a rather thin crust. I prepare the pie plate by coating it with olive oil to prevent the dough from sticking and give a bit more flavor. Gluten-free flour has a tendency to be dry and brittle. A bit of oil improves its flavor and texture. Once I was happy with the thickness of the crust, I carefully transferred it to the pie plate. Ideally, it should be so thin as to be translucent. This is a rustic looking tart with rough edges. I found that fiddling with gluten-free flour is not worth the trouble as it tends to start coming apart. I drizzled a bit more olive oil and spread it on top of the crust to give more flavor. With the crust ready to bake, I set it aside momentarily while I prepared the filling. I carefully washed the collected dandelion greens that had been soaking in the bowl. I drained them and transferred them to the cutting bowl, chopping them roughly with a knife. Oh, 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 
I drop the chopped leaves onto a skillet over high heat to wilt them down and flavor them. A pinch of paprika and cayenne pepper added spice and dimension to the dish, complementing the bitter flavors of the dandelion. I mixed everything well with a wooden spoon, sprinkling a pinch of salt to taste. You want the greens to wilt down, but you do not want to overcook them, since they are still going to bake in the oven. Before adding the greens on top of the tart, I spread a thin layer of tomato sauce. I was using store-bought tomato sauce because this was early spring and I had gone through all my frozen homemade homegrown tomato sauce by late winter. I dropped the wilted greens on top and went about preparing the cashew walnut olive cream that would add flavor and richness to this tart. Using a mocajete, I crushed a handful of cashews and walnuts together with a few Kalamata olives and some water. The amount of water will influence how runny your cream will be. You can also use a blender to prepare this cream. Just remember to remove all olive pips prior to throwing them into the blender. Also monitor the amount of salt you want the recipe to have by the number of olives you add. I made a more dense cream with rougher texture to be spooned over the tart, but you can make it more runny and smooth. Just don't have it be too watery, otherwise the tart will not be crispy and dry. I spread the cream amongst the greens and folded over the edges. I then put it into a medium heat oven to cook and crisp up for about 20 to 30 minutes. After that I removed it and made sure to enjoy it. The diversity of flavor spectrums in this dish makes it something special. Bitter flavors are often not appreciated in our western culture although they are celebrated in others. It may take a bit of getting used to its strong flavor. But if you can get used to it, dandelion has a deliciously complex flavor that is very much complemented by the sweetness and acidity of the tomato sauce and the richness of the cashew cream. I have to say, this is one of my favorite recipes I have come up with and the fact that it used the so-called weed has made me look at keeping a lawn in a different light.